trends in inequality across regions uh, and, uh, of the world and within large economies. And uh, we, one of the um, apparently empirical evidences that we, we note in the past uh, uh, decades is that there is a worsening inequality as the richer income group uh, captured the bulk of uh, gains from economic growth. And this session is uh, would uh, seek to understand how this global uh, economic uh, restructuring, what are the mega trends and acceleration in uh, technological change is affecting uh, the fairness and inclusiveness of, uh, of uh, humanity's progress. So uh, for this session, we have four speakers, but uh, if you note, the first speaker will be a videotape presentation followed by uh, speakers from uh, the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, and, uh, and from the PIDS. Um, uh, we were advised that it's better to put the video, a videotape presentation at the end. But uh, if you look at the flow of the discussion, I think it would be best to first look at the international or global um, trends, then we move on to uh, technological revolution, how is it affecting inequality in Asia, so the regional trends, then the, the national trends, and community trends in, in the case of the, the Philippines. So uh, I will, uh, uh, each of the speakers for house rules will uh, have 20 minutes each, and then uh, we, uh, we first ask the speakers to present uh, their, uh, their papers before we open the floor for uh, discussion. So, uh, without, so we can start with our first speaker, which is a videotaped uh, presentation by Dr. Lucas Sh uh, Chancel, a co-director of World Inequality Lab of the Paris School of Economics. Um, you can, f I, don't need, I don't think I need to, to uh, explain to read his, uh, you can read his uh, uh, brief bio in the conference program. So can we have the video, please? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation to this conference. I would have liked to be present today. Unfortunately, this was not possible. And doing this uh, presentation by video is also a way to save a lot on carbon emissions, which uh, beyond global inequality is one of the other challenges of the decades to come. So let me get uh, straight to the beginning of this uh, speech. My presentation is entitled Global Inequality Trends and Drivers. My name is Lucas Chancel. I'm one of the co-directors of the World Inequality Lab. This is an international research institutions who, whose headquarters are based in Paris and in Berkeley, California. We operate with a network of uh, over 100 researchers located over all um, continents. In order to combine the most recent, the most transparent data sources that allow us to track income and wealth inequality, both from a uh, international and historical perspective. So what we do is that we, com we combine national accounts, we combine tax data, we combine data that we are able to obtain from uh, uh, leaks like the Panama Papers or the HSBC uh, leaks in order to provide the most um, accurate picture of the evolution of inequality and of the level of inequality today. And we feel this had to be done because there is currently a gap in um, transparency when it comes to measuring and tracking income and wealth inequality. Very often, public statistics do not provide an accurate picture of inequality levels, partly because um, some flows, financial flows, are very poorly monitored across countries. This relates to tax evasion, but also partly because the statistical tools of um, national statisticians are not tailored 
to properly tracking inequality. Survey data, as statisticians know, um, tend to, to largely under-report, underestimate top incomes and top wealth levels. And administrative tax data is a good way to have a better information on what is happening at the top of the distribution within countries. And we now know that a lot of the action has been taking place precisely at the top of the distribution. So it is important to have the right set of statistical tools, the right amount of data, the right set of data to measure these trends. And this is what we seek to do with um, the Distributional National Accounts Project that uh, is published on the World Inequality data Database. What we seek to do is really to reconcile microeconomic, the microeconomic study of inequality with the macroeconomic uh, study of the economy. And we seek to reconcile databases, we seek to reconcile different concepts in order to provide an accurate picture of the distribution of economic growth. If we look at a four, 40 years period, starting in 1980, what I'll show is that despite the strong rise of emerging countries, strong growth in China, in India and other large emerging countries, um, global inequality, understood as inequality between world citizens, has increased in the world over this uh, time span. And this is one of the key results of uh, our World Inequality Report, published in 2018, and I will largely draw from this report in this presentation. The top 1% captured twice as much global income growth as the bottom 50% between 1980 and um, today. That being said, what is extremely important to have in mind is that the rise of inequality within countries that we observe throughout the world across different regions and across regions uh, with very different social and political organizations. Um, there's a lot of variation, there's a lot of uh, variance in the trajectories that we observe and this is what is really interesting because this is what reveals that uh, there's no fatality in this rise of inequality across countries. It, the rise of inequality is not uh, a deterministic byproduct of globalization or of technological progress. It is really the result of policies. And it, it is really um, when we start to look at the changes in institutional frameworks, the changes in tax policies, the changes in terms of investments in education that we're able to understand the different trajectories followed by different countries when it comes to their inequality trends and drivers. So um, the key conclusion is that policies matter a lot, but that in order to inform um, these policies and policy debates on inequality, we need more transparency of income and wealth in their daily lives. And this is what I will try to, to show in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, preliminary, preliminary ways on how to uh, reconcile the macro and the micro. So let me start with um, income inequality uh, across key world regions from 1982 to today. So this is the top 10% income share, very standard um, or very simple measure of inequality. In a perfectly unequal world, the top 10% income share would be 100%. In a perfectly equal world, this uh, top 10% income share would be 10%. And we see that countries start in 1980 at various levels. Bulk of countries, India, US, Canada, Russia, China, Europe, around 30%, and Russia, slightly more than 20%. What is striking here is this generalized rise of inequality across these regions, but this rise happened at very different speeds. And what is particularly interesting to show here is the contrasted trajectory between Russia, for instance, the most equal country in uh, this subset of regions up to 1991, and in just five years, it becomes 
the most unequal country in the world, at least one of the most unequal countries in the world. So the extent of rising inequality was uh, absolutely huge in a, in a short period of time. Another country that experienced a strong rise of inequality, but a rise that was much more progressive, is um, India or the uh, USA, starting from around 30-35% for the top 10% income share to 47% uh, in the US today and much more 56% in India, but huge rise in both uh, regions over this uh, four decades time span and more moderate increases in China and in, and in Europe. Now if we take a um, a broader historical perspective, all these regions in 1980 are at the end uh, of what we could call a relatively low inequality period. And whether um, we think about mixed economy regimes, US, Canada and Europe, whether we think about socialist or communist economies, Russia, China or highly regulated economies like India, from the 1950s broadly speaking, from the interwar period or the, the, the end of the Second World War to the late 1970s, all these regions went to a phase of compression of inequality and of very low inequality levels by historical standards in the late 1970s and with a rise afterwards. So the questions we might want to ask ourselves is where are these regions going to? What um, could be the new normal in terms of inequality levels? Well, in order to discuss this question, I'm adding on this graph three regions, Middle East, Brazil, Sub-Saharan Africa. There is, uh, the data is of um, um, not as good uh, quality uh, before the 1980s, but evidence points towards um, the fact that these three regions did not go through this phase of inequality reduction throughout the second half of the 20th century. So, income inequality levels relatively stable in these three regions, but at extreme levels. And these very high inequality regions could actually set the new horizon in terms of inequality within countries. So the question really is, uh, are these formerly low inequality regions uh, getting back to these historically extreme levels of inequality which these uh, regions experienced earlier in their historical development at the uh, beginning of the 20th century and in the 19th uh, century. Before I get back to this question of the future, let me first um, d do a, a thought experiment. What would happen to inequality in all these regions if we were breaking national boundaries, so what happens to inequality between world citizens, irrespective of their nationality. And one very powerful way to, uh, to look at this is to focus on um, so-called growth incidence curve, that is for each group of the world population, ranked from the poorest on the left to the richest on the right, and we have here 100 groups uh, of the global population, so the bottom 1% uh, to the top 1%. And uh, for each of these percentile, what we plot here is uh, the real income growth rate per adult over uh, the 1980 to 2016 period. And what comes out of this graph very nicely, very neatly, is what we could um, present as three pictures of globalization. The first picture of globalization is a relatively positive, or very positive picture. Strong growth in emerging countries, growth over 100%, doubling of incomes in real terms. So this is um, the emerging countries catching up with the West, and this is a very positive news for the global economy. Now, if we go to the right-hand side of the curve, it appears that some groups grew at a much lower level, below 50%. We'll see that in some countries, growth for the bottom half of the population, some rich countries like the US, growth for the bottom half was actually much lower than 40%. It was actually close to 0% over this entire time period. So this is a more negative 
picture of globalization. And finally, what is happening at the very right-hand side of the graph also deserves attention. Growth rates over 200% for the top 1%. And what we're really here able to show, thanks to the new combination of administrative tax data, national accounts, and surveys, is the extent of this increase. So, one might say that what is happening here at the top um, is not necessarily meaningful from a macroeconomic point of view because this only represents 1% of the global population so in the end perhaps we should not really care about what is happening there and what really is important is what is happening here and, and here. Well, in order to um, answer this, this question, this remark, uh, a good way uh, to move forward is actually to present the exact same data. So that's the exact same data, except um, the scale is a bit different here. Basically, uh, we are exploding the top 1% into different subgroups, and what I'm representing on this, on, in this box is um, the fact that the top 1% itself represents 1% of the global population by definition, but captured 27% of total growth. And this is also what is illustrated on this axis, about 30%, um, a bit less, but this represents uh, much better the extent here of the growth that is captured by the top 1%. And this, is this has to be compared with the total growth captured by the bottom 50% over the period, just 12% of total growth. So about twice as much of all the new euros, the new rupees, the new yuans, the new dollars created in the world since 1980, more than twice as much of all this growth was captured by the top 1% itself rather than by the bottom 50%. So this is a rise, this can be translated in a rise of global inequality despite the rise of emerging countries. And this is one of the key, uh, the, the key novelty, the key new results we now know about the evolution of global income dynamics over the past decades. Now, another question could be that, in fact, we needed very strong growth at the top in order to have growth at the bottom, the so-called trickle-down narrative or trickle-down theory about economics. So what can we say about uh, trickle-down? Well, let me just focus on two sets of uh, countries, the US and Western Europe to start with, and then I will focus on uh, uh, China and India. So here we have the US on the left, Western Europe on the right from 1980 to 2016, two indicators, um, the top 1% income share, the bottom 50% income share. What we see on this graph is that we have two regions, the US, Western Europe, that are broadly similar in terms of size, in terms of population, in terms of level of development, and in terms of inequality levels in 1980. We see that the top income share and the bottom 50% income share are broad, uh, fall in the relatively similar ranges. But over the course of time, the evolution are strikingly different. In the US, there's a complete inversion or almost complete inversion of the relative positions of the top 1% and of the bottom 50%. The bottom 50%, its shared national income collapses from 20% to a bit more than 10%. And at the same time, the top 1% rises to about 10% to 20%. This was, this, happen in the context of a near stagnation of bottom 50% average incomes in the US. So the bottom half, the poorest half of the American population was cut off from economic growth. Very different picture in Western Europe. What is important to have in mind here as well is that these are pre-tax incomes. This is not after redistribution. So the big gap in terms of US-Europe dynamics is not a matter, is not primarily a matter of what is happening to the fiscal and redistribution system, but it is what is happening with pre-distribution or with market incomes.
And this is extremely important to have in mind when we start to think about the set of policies. And I will give a, a word on that afterwards. Uh, the final point is that inequality is not about trade or technology per se. These two regions opened up in relatively similar ways to trade and to technologies over the period, but followed radically diverging pathways. Um, if we focus on um, China and India, we have relatively similar um, a similar general message, even though indeed these are very different regions at very different levels of their development and with very different uh, institutional setups, but similar levels of inequality in 1980 and diverging trajectories over the course of time. So basically, um, the opening to global markets, the liberalization of the economy, or at least parts of the economy, can be done in very different ways. And what is also interesting to see in India versus China is that if you look at the top of the top of the distribution in both countries, you have very similar growth rates. That being said, um, at the bottom of the distribution, the bottom 50% of Chinese grew four times faster than bottom 50% of Indians. So it is not because the very rich Chinese grew much, much faster than in India that the bottom 50% or the poorest Chinese grew much higher at a much higher rate than in India. The reasons needs to be fine uh, elsewhere and this has a lot to do with uh, the importance of educational health investments or investments in infrastructure in rural areas in China that were not done in the same extent in, um, in India. So I will uh, skip this slide skip this slide and I will now move on to um, this graph about the future of global inequality. Um, and what is, what is presented here is the evolution of the top 1% income share from 1980 to 2016, the bottom 50% income share. And in grey here, uh, a set of possible scenarios for the future. Indeed, we don't know what the future of inequality will be be like at the world level, but we can make projections. What is um, useful in this, uh, in this exercise, in my sense, is that we see that if we assume that emerging countries continue to catch up, and here we're pretty optimistic, we're more optimistic than the OECD, for instance, uh, when it comes to the catch-up, the future catch-up of Africa, the future catch-up of Latin America, or Central Asia, or Southeast Asia, um, if, we, if countries continue to distribute income growth in the same way as they've done since 1980, so business as usual distribution of growth, but more overall growth for emerging countries in the future than in the past, well, then we still are on a continuing trend in terms of the rising global top 1% income share. Indeed, other trajectories are possible if all countries distribute growth in the same way as the US did over the past decades, the top 1% income share will be even higher than uh, in the business as usual scenario, about 27% by 2050. Now, the countries can also distribute growth in a fairer way. And we see here that if uh, the European trajectory is followed, there is a slight reduction of um, the top 1% income share. But the bottom line is that between country convergence will not be sufficient to reduce global inequality or to counter the strong divergence that is happening within countries. And one of the key messages that I would like to um, have here is that between 1980 and today we move from a world where nationality mattered slightly more than within countries uh, inequalities than class, let's put it that way, to a world where nationality matters less than income differences within countries when we try to understand global inequality between individuals. When I say that, I don't mean that there's no between-country uh, inequalities anymore, 
but these inequalities now matter less than within country differences when we try to explain um, global inequality. I will skip these slides and conclude here by saying that with the publication of this data, we, our objective is not to make everybody agree on inequality. Uh, I had uh, more slides on uh, taxation, tax evasion, the importance of educational investments. There's no silver bullet to tackle inequality, even though that my sense there are many silver bullets. If you want to tackle the rise of incomes and wealth at the top, progressive taxation is key. But if you want to lift uh, the bottom 50% income growth, in, uh, investments in, educations, in education are key. And how do you finance important investments in education and universal access to education or health? Well, tax progressivity is key. So there needs to be a connection, an integration of pre-distribution uh, policies and redistribution policies like taxes. That being said, what really matters is that everybody, policymakers, media, researchers, should have access to quality information about the distribution of growth. And this is not the case at the moment. Governments should publish these statistics with the help of the United Nations. And um, this will be essential to find appropriate policy responses to these trends. The positive news is that, yes, there has been a rise of global inequality, but this rise is not a fatality. We could have organized globalization in a very different way. And the different trajectories across countries suggest that much more equitable pathways can be followed in the future. There's much more than what I said in the World Inequality Report, which is available online on wid.world. Thank you very much for your attention. So as, I, as, the, as it was mentioned in the video, uh, the report, this presentation is actually based on the World Inequality uh, 2018 report and that can be accessed online. So if you want uh, further information, probably we can uh, have that accessed uh, online. Okay, so um, Dr. Chantel, Chancel raised very important issues with regards to global inequality, that global inequality is indeed uh, rising, that uh, policies, institutions are important, and uh, actually he, he also mentioned that uh, inequality um, may, may not necessarily be about globalization and technology per se. And he also uh, raised the importance of the need for uh, transparency especially in, uh, in data, tax data, to be able to appropriately uh, provide the policy responses to, to these trends. So with that, um, let's move on to our next uh, presenter, um, Dr. Donghun Park. Uh, let, let me just uh, provide some background. Sorry. Okay, Dr. Dong Yun Park is a principal economist at the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of the ADB. Um, but prior to joining ADB, he was a professor of economics in Nanyang, Nanyang Technico Technological University in Singapore. Uh, he obtained his PhD in economics from the University of California, uh, Los Angeles, and his main research fields are international finance, international trade, and development economics. And he will present to us uh, the relationship between uh, inequality, technology and uh, inequality in Asia. So, Dr. Park. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh,
So I'm going to talk about uh, inequality in Asia. The previous speaker, the VideoCon speaker, gave a very, very good uh, picture and description of global inequality and its implications. Now I'm going to uh, make my presentation from a more regional perspective and also from the perspective of a specific issue, and that issue being the effect of technological progress, which we all know is crucial for economic growth and development in any economy, but we, all, we, but we are also aware, or at least conventional wisdom has it, that the technological progress along with international trade, right, is on the whole beneficial, but it can uh, uh, worsen inequality and it can have a significant uh, negative impact on inequality, that is uh, uh, both international trade and technological progress, right, are often viewed as the main uh, culprits behind this uh, global trend uh, towards uh, worsening inequality. I mean, as economists, uh, we, are, uh, we are generally uh, encouraged to use positive terms, but I happen to think inequality is a bad thing. So. I'm not going to say widening inequality, I would say worsening uh, inequality. Now having said that, where is it? Where is Is it over there? I don't think it's working, so I'll just uh, motion to her. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so let, let, let me... What? Oh, it's on now. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, if you look at this uh, diagram, you, you look at country, countries are very uh, diverse, heterogeneous uh, income and... Uh, development levels, right? Bangladesh, uh, which is a typical low-income country, all the way up to uh, China, right? PRC, which is an upper-middle-income country, at least according to World Bank definition. So these are countries at very different income and development levels. And if you look at these uh, countries in uh, between 1990 and 2017, right? In other words, uh, basically over the last three decades, income inequality, uh, when it's measured by uh, what people actually consume, right? Not just the income which they save and don't spend, but what they actually consume, right? Which has a direct impact on quality of life. Of the richest 10%, their share of consumption has risen and risen significantly in all these countries that jointly, right? Uh, collectively account for quite a large part of a developing Asia's uh, population. This includes countries like uh, Bang uh, India, right? Uh, China, PRC, and uh, uh, Indonesia, right? And the Bangladesh, all these are very uh, populous countries, countries with, uh, with large populations and also quite large, uh, large economies. So I think uh, one thing that has to be emphasized here is that growing inequality and then there's a poverty reduction, right? These are quite different things, quite different phenomenon. And the developing Asia, uh, 
which is basic, it's an AB, ADB terminology, it's basically ex-Japan Asia, right? Developing Asia grew rapidly, right? So rapidly for such a sustained period of time, right? G developing Asia grew faster than and faster than by a wide margin, other parts of the developing world, right? Uh, whether that's uh, emerging Europe, right? Or uh, Middle East and North Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa and all these uh, other, uh, Latin America certainly, uh, and, the, and then of course advanced countries, but of course advanced countries, economics, uh, I mean, economics 101 tells us uh, advanced countries grow richer because they're much richer, grow slower than uh, than developing countries, so that's not so impressive. But developing Asia has certainly performed much better than other parts of the developing world. And as a result of that, uh, I don't have that picture here, but uh, our record of poverty reduction, right? In other words, however you define poverty, right? Uh, the percentage of people or citizens living on less than $1 per day or $1.50 per day, so when, when, when we say developing Asia grew so rapidly, and then, and then some Western guys and these guys say, oh, but that's just rapid growth. It's not quality of growth. It's not broad-based base growth. But of course, that's not true because we, what, the, probably the most important byproduct of a 30, 40-year run that developing Asia is having in terms of rapid, sustained rapid growth is a uh, historically unprecedented reduction in poverty. So if you look at... The, the cumulative reduction in poverty, it's much, much larger than in, than in other parts of the developing world, right? Like uh, Middle East and the North uh, Africa, for example. If you look at a, a, a region like that, I mean, there's, uh, there's been much less reduction in poverty. And as a, as a result of that, we all know where, where that ultimately leads to, right? The economic stagnation, right? Economic stagnation leads to social stagnation and then... And then this kind of IS and all these kind of, uh, uh, what is it, uh, extremist groups, right? It's, it's not a, in my view, it's not a religious issue. It's ultimately the uh, product of economic failure, right? Economic stagnation. When you have millions and millions of uh, unemployed youth, right, with, a, with burning, raging energy, right? And then the only uh, potential job is uh, redundant, right? Redundant in the sense it's not really necessary. Uh, government or public sector job, right, because the public sector is so stagnant and economy as a whole is stagnant, then of course uh, this leads to broader social problems. Now having said that, so developing Asia, we really have an impressive, right, record of growing ra uh, rapidly in terms of GDP growth, but at the same time reducing poverty at an, by an unprecedented margin in a very short, uh, in a relatively rather short period of time. So economic, sustained economic growth is a great thing. So is the, perhaps what I consider the biggest uh, benefit of that or biggest the consequence of, of that, which is unprecedented poverty reduction. Having said that, we in uh, developing Asia are not immune for, from this global problem of rising inequality. And then of course, uh, it's, an issue, it's a worldwide issue, it uh, affects uh, all parts, of the, uh, all parts of the developing world, it affects advanced countries, emerging markets, developing countries. It affects all regions of the world, right? So, I mean, this explains why a relatively technical and a relatively difficult book like uh, Thomas Piketty's uh, Capital in the 21st Century, right, has become such a global bestseller, right, despite being such a technical book book and it's uh, of course Thomas Piketty uh, is a very strong rigorous economist I think he was an MIT economics professor at one time in any case uh, so the book as you can expect is very econometric is very technical and despite that right it's become a global seller why because this arising inequality is garnering so much attention worldwide the point here is we in Asia are also facing this problem, right? As it, but it's a global problem. It's certainly not an Asia-specific problem. Okay. So why does income inequality matter, right? Well, one thing is it, it's a, it's a germane or it's relevant or it's related to what I talked about earlier, right? The poverty uh, poverty reduction. As you can see, I mean, this is just a counterfactual. But if inequality remained the same 
as opposed to increasing, as it, and it actually increased in these economies, with the same GDP growth rate, 165 million more people would have li been lifted out of poverty. And that's, a, that's a not, not a small number. It's almost 5% uh, of the region's, uh, region's population. In other words, uh, inequality and poverty, yes, they are different concepts, but at the same time, one has an impact on the other. In other words, uh, inequality does have an impact on, a, on a poverty. And then, and then of course, uh, one thing that I, uh, I heard earlier today, which came ac across as a, uh, as a negative, unpleasant uh, surprise, was that the one-third of uh, a Filipino children, right, are, are undernourished, right, at a young, early age. Of course, that kind of, uh, that kind of inequality, quite clearly, but uh, I mean, having I mean, before I talk about that, I do think the Philippines' uh, recent economic performance is impressive, right? By any by any uh, measure, and it's also relatively broad-based in one sense, in the sense that if you, because because uh, um, uh, my family and I eat out, right? On on Sunday for Sunday lunch, we invariably go out and have lunch. But anyway, so. When we go out, and this was because uh, my, my wife, it was my wife's observation, sometimes she's more uh, perceptive than I am, and then she said that you could really feel the middle class, right, of this country expanding. You see, you see more and more people joining the middle class, so it's quite broad-based uh, growth that Philippines is experiencing, so it's not just a, 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 a growing at 6-7%, but benefiting only a tiny elite, I mean, that kind of growth, I, I, would, I think we would all agree, is not very uh, beneficial. But it's not that kind of growth. It's a, it's a kind of growth that is increasing visibly, that you can even feel it when you go out into the city. That kind of broad-based, middle-class expanding growth. But having said that, I mean, if one-third of the children are undernourished, of course, that that is a bad thing, and it's a, it's 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 not a it's certainly not a good thing for for human capital accumulation. It's not a certainly not a good thing for future economic uh, growth. Now, when you have rising inequality, sometimes people are often talk about this. Uh, what is this uh, trade-off, right, between inequality and uh, economic growth, or between uh, income equity, between equity and efficiency, right, between uh, equity and economic efficiency? That the idea is. Uh, to, to grow faster, you have to suffer a higher level of inequality and, and vice versa, right? I think we, we, all, uh, we all have heard that argument, that trade-off, that argument about the trade-off in one form or another. And then so, but recent uh, economic analysis, econometric, empi rigorous uh, empirical analysis, I think uh, the most widely known one is done by IMF, right, a few years ago, and it does show that uh, inequality Rising inequality has a negative effect on growth. But, but I think you really don't need to do any econometrics to, to just intuitively see that, of course, there's no trade-off. Of course, inequality is bad for growth. Why? Because it's inequality of opportunity, right? In other words, uh, say you're the only, only way you can be rich, right? I think this is part of the global backlash against the market economies and private enterprise and capitalism these days right now. It's the idea that uh, before, right, I mean, I, I mean, let's go to America, the U.S., right, the bastion, of course, China is also a powerful bastion of uh, capitalism, right, and entrepreneurship, right, contrary to uh, people's <laughs> completely mistaken, nonsensical uh, view of China as state capitalism. China grew so rapidly despite the government, not because of the government. I think uh, uh, if you haven't read it so uh, uh, read it yet, please read this uh, really book. It, it doesn't have any econometric. It just have nice tables. This book, uh, what is it? Markets over Mao by uh, Nicholas Lardy, right, of Peterson Institute in DC, and it quite to me decisively, conclusively shows China's growth, its employment generation, right. In every way, China's economic dynamism is due to a thriving private sector, not the government. So this, uh, this nonsensical equation of China with uh, state capitalism is one thing uh, I really uh, have a hard time why people uh, keep believing in that, uh, in that nonsense. But in any case, going back to the U.S., you, I mean, why do you have like this uh, uh, populism, okay? And that, that populism, of course, uh, 
uh, most uh, evident, right, in recent uh, in the political developments, right? Let's uh, let, without naming names, like uh, 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 let, let, let's just put it that way: political developments, and not, not just the U.S. Of course, you, uh, in the U.K., you had Brexit, and it's not just U.K. in Europe. It's all across Europe. You have this kind of populist. Uh, ultra right wing parties are emerging why is that of course there are there are there are many issues it's not it's not a multi it's not a single sing, it's not due to a single factor right it's a multi dimensional multifaceted uh, trend i mean there are many reasons for that of course uh, one is immigration right and then uh, uh, more more specifically opposition to immigration or hostility to immigration but I think, and I think uh, many, many would agree, that the, perhaps the more powerful force behind this, uh, what happened in the U.S. in 2016, or this Brexit, or what is happening in many countries in Europe, right? It's this uh, kind of a backlash against uh, capitalism, against the free markets, against the private enterprise. And that backlash, in, in turn, is due to the notion that uh, increasingly, right, Increasingly, we don't have the capitalism. It's not the best man wins kind of capitalism. It's not if somebody got rich because he, let's say Steve Jobs, I mean, I don't idolize him or anything, but it's an example all of you know, right? So that, that's why I mention him. Somebody, an entrepreneur, a bold, a visionary, risk-taking entrepreneur in the Adam Smithian sense, in the best sense of capitalism sense, he creates a very useful, socially useful product or service or IT application or whatnot, he becomes a multimillionaire several times over. Nobody, I would say nobody or very few people would have any issues with that. But increasingly, that's not the kind of capitalism we are seeing. That's, of course, that kind of capitalism ultimately rests in the assumption that uh, anybody with the, with the drive, with the talent, with the vision, with the boldness, can make it, right? It, it, it implies a level playing field in the end, that kind of a entrepreneurial capitalism, or what I would call merit-based capitalism, or what I would call best man wins capitalism. Increasingly, what you see throughout the world is, uh, even in the US, right, that so-called bastion of capitalism, is increasingly what you see in the real world is not that kind of entrepreneurial Adam Smithian, Steve Jobsian capitalism, but I'm rich because my father is rich. I'm rich because my parents are rich. Oh, I got into Harvard or Princeton or whatever through legacy. And then this kind of a, what I would call hereditary capitalism. Of course, just commonsensically, intuitively, it doesn't take a genius, it doesn't take an economist to figure out that economic growth would be lower and significantly lower under this kind of inequality of opportunity, under this kind of a, hereditary, what I would call hereditary capitalism, than it would be under a uh, merit or best man wins uh, kind of uh, capitalism. Okay, so what, so what are the basic main drivers of, sorry, what are the main uh, drivers of uh, inequality? Well, as I said earlier, there are, there are a couple of uh, well-known ones, technological progress and uh, globalization and the market deregulations. But of course, uh, in all of these, there is a common element. It is that uh, the skilled, right? Those with the skills, right? Those uh, who have some kind of skills or expertise, they have an advantage, right? Over those who are less skilled, skilled workers over unskilled workers, capital over labor, right? You see, uh, you, the, the inequality you see in this world is, is largely uh, inequality it's, it's also inequality of income, but even more so it's inequality of wealth, right, that we are, and then growing inequality of wealth, and also this kind of a, a spatial inequality, right, big cities rich, remote rural areas poor, right, China, coastal areas rich, interior provinces uh, uh, poor, and of course, aging, population aging, we, which we are experiencing, a rapid aging Asia, that can be an additional factor, okay, and then as you can see quite clearly, Labor's share of national income has declined in many uh, where is it, Asian countries. And then, of course, you also see this kind of spatial inequality, urban area versus rural area, that's also increasing. So let's focus on the technology inequality. But I think uh, 
I think I have uh, about three minutes left, but I think I can really summarize this. Uh, uh, it's based on an Asian development outlook, uh, special theme chapter 2008. I think the title was, was uh, Technology and Jobs or Technology. It was a very uh, well, well made, uh, 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 very uh, excellent uh, theme chapter. But I think the key message that comes out of it is every time we have uh, some kind of technological revolution, right, whether that's that's ICT, right, in the mid-90s mid to early 2000s, right? The, the, it happened largely during the Clinton years, right, that the ICT revolution, and that really led to big uh, improvement in productivity, right, because it drastically, if you think about it, drastically reduced the cost of communicating and disseminating information. So it really was an information and communication technology revolution. And then, they, and then at that time, everybody was, oh, it's, it's, like, it's so different this time. Millions of jobs are going to be destroyed and so forth and so forth. Now, we are witnessing, we are in the middle of another type of technological revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. Things like artificial intelligence, things like Internet of Things, things like 3D printing, right? Things like nanotechnology, things like robotics, right? Yeah, all these things. And then, we, and then everybody's, oh, this time it's really different. Oh, and then we all, we, all, we all have this, go back to this Luddite, right? L-U-D-D-I-T-E, I think. Luddite way of thinking, oh, there's this huge technological progress. We learn on technological progress. Millions and millions of lose, uh, workers are going to lose their job. But guess what? If you, if you, uh, it's largely the same old story, right? Same old story. In other words, there is plenty of cause for optimism, and at a minimum, there is no undue cause for pessimism. In other words, there's very little to believe that this time around, it will be different. There are so many positive factors offsetting this, new jobs, new industries, uh, stronger demand, and so forth. And then, of course, what are the things that, are, and are, of course, there are many ways you can look at this, as you can see, a uh, non-routine, uh, cognitive, uh, uh, non-routine and more cognitive, more skill and intelligence requiring jobs. Wages have grown faster than more routine jobs. And policy responses, if you look at the policy responses, what you will be struck is this. Oh, they said exactly the, these kinds of things, although new, nuanced slightly different in the, when there was ICT revolution. And then when, when there was some technological revolution before that, it's all about how the economy adjusts. The role of the government really should be to help the economy structurally adjust better through, for example, flexible labor markets. Of course, we do need social protection. We do need to protect workers and industries that lose out, right? Obviously, but the key response has to be lubricating through flexible labor markets, through worker training and retraining, lubricating the wheels of the economy's uh, structural adjustment to this kind of technological change and then I think that there is pl plenty of cause for optimism. And then lastly, because this is, we are he here in Manila, and this is a, so let me just say something about the Philippines context. There's a lot of worry, right? There are a lot of concern about call centers. And let's face it, uh, it has been actually a big engine of growth for, for the Filipino economy. And it's been a better, very source of good, high quality jobs, right? Relatively speaking call center job. So, and then, of course, something like call centers, you, uh, experts tell me, I'm not an expert, tech, uh, I'm not an expert on the techno technology of call centers, so I, w I wouldn't know personally, but experts, every expert I talked about this tells me this, the same story, and it's not a story probably uh, you or your uh, friends want to hear, it's that uh, many of these call center jobs, if not most of them, will indeed be phased out, because if you think about it, it's quite easy to automate. But you know what the good news is? If you look at the evidence, Filipino, the, the ICT BPO industry here, the business process outsourcing industry, it's already moving up. It's already leveling up, and I think that's a very encouraging sign. It's a, it shows signs that Philippine economy is structurally flexible. It can structurally adjust to the challenges posed by this kind of technological revolution. So in short, the more things change, right, the more things actually stay the same. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Park, for that uh, uh, very clear and comprehensive uh, presentation. I think this is also based from the Asian uh, Development Outlook, which was published in 2017. 
And uh, I think it's available online at the uh, ADB website. So um, uh, may I also recognize our timekeeper, just in case uh, you want to track uh, the, the time. So this, that's Isai. He, she will just be raising the, the cards uh, when, uh, 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 during the periods that uh, um, are critical when you, uh, to, to track the, whether you're, you're still within the 20 minute uh, um, uh, time. Okay, so for our, uh, yes, uh, so Dr. Park has basically looked at the regional trends on inequality and this is measured in terms of expenditure and I think he made a very important point with regards to the importance of tracking down inequality and looking at the drivers of inequality. And in, indeed, he, uh, technological progress is uh, one of the, of the factors that could uh, lead to uh, inequality, especially if uh, this is not being harnessed by, uh, by, by, can, by uh, the technological, the opportunities from technological revolution is not uh, being harnessed by, by countries. And there are very important uh, policy implications of this in terms of uh, of uh, education and training, as well as uh, support for uh, technological change in terms of investments in AC ICT uh, and also the regulatory uh, environment that would uh, uh, bring about more efficient, uh, um, eff effective and efficient use of, uh, of uh, technological uh, changes. Okay, so uh, our next speaker, uh, is from uh, is Gabriel de Mombin. Dr. de Mombin is a, a World Bank program leader for human development for Brunei, Malaysia, Philippines, and Thailand. Uh, he's based in Manila and leads the bank's program in uh, uh, the areas of education, health, nutrition, population, social protection, jobs, uh, and poverty reduction, reduction in those uh, countries that I mentioned. Um, uh, he holds a PhD in economics from the University of California, Berkeley, and a bachelor's degree, degree in uh, civil engineering and humanities from the University of Texas at Austin. So uh, he will talk about poverty and inequality, and this is closer to home because he's looking at uh, national trends. So, Dr. Gabriel. Thanks very much. I'm very pleased to have a chance to talk to you today. And I, I like the organization very much of this session, starting off at the global level and talking about the regional level and all focus on the Philippines. And then I'm curious to see exactly what Ruel discusses, maybe inequality in this room or something along those lines. So, <laughs> um, so I th of course, poverty and inequality kind of covers everything. So I struggled a little bit to figure out what to, to, to discuss. I thought I would talk a bit about uh, the facts, the numbers we have on poverty and inequality in the Philippines, and then talk about uh, what I see as the principal policy steps, the principal priorities uh, for addressing poverty and inequality. Uh, so in the second part, what I'll present draws uh, from work we did for the poverty assessment in the Philippines that was published last year. I have a bunch of copies of the executive summary, so please afterwards, you're welcome to come up and pick one up. And of course, uh, the full report is on the web. And we're also preparing uh, what we call, it's in a very sort of World Bankish uh, terminology, we call our, our systematic country diagnostic, which is the World Bank's overall take uh, on the Philippines, which draws from the poverty assessment uh, and a bunch of other work that we've done recently. And I, I've been leading that, and we're in, we're in the final stages of that work. We've actually s sent uh, the draft copy to the government uh, for review to get their to get their reflections on it, and that will come out uh, in the next in the next couple of months. So this is in some sense a preview of our unpublished uh, systematic country diagnostic. Okay, so first, so my initial training before I became more of a 
coordinator or uh, manager at the bank was uh, as a poverty economist, so I couldn't resist the temptation to give you a full description of the ins and outs of the poverty figures for the Philippines. And I, and I found that not just for the Philippines, but for most countries in the world, the numbers tend to be quite confusing because there can be many different poverty lines, different rates. So I'll do my best to explain the, the somewhat confusing story for the Philippines. So uh, th I think in the Philippines, the story tends to be a little bit confusing because uh, data is collected in the FICE survey every three years uh, for the poverty, to determine the poverty rate and, and other things. Uh, and PSA releases poverty rates for the full year once they have the, the full year of survey data, but they also release a poverty rate just based on the first half of the year. Uh, and that's because they don't have the full data until and they, don't, they don't wait until they have the full data for the entire year. They want to give sort of a preview of the poverty situation. So the result is you end up with these sort of two different series, which I think can cause some confusion. So this figure shows, the blue line on this figure shows the poverty rates for the Philippines based on the FICE uh, using the full year data for 2006 up through 2015. The solid red line shows the poverty rates for uh, the first half of the year that, that were published. And you can see that in every case, the poverty rates were lower for the full year than in the first half of the year. Now, I haven't done a full analysis of this, but I think this must be because in the second half of the year, it's, it's harvest time in many parts of the country. Also, many people have a 13-month uh, salary that they're paid. It's also the period of the holidays, so people have more remittances come in, there's more spending. So for a bunch of reasons, the second half of the year is sort of a higher income and higher consumption period. Uh, so an additional complication comes from the fact that it, uh, that PSA is also switching now from a, a CPI, the price index, with an old basis to a new basis. The dotted line here shows the first half poverty rates based on the new basis CPI for 2015 and for 2018. So you can see that shift from the old CPI, which is the, with the, the solid lines, to the new CPI, that caused a slight increase in the measured poverty rate in 2015. But what's important is then you see the trend for 2015 to 2018 is quite a substantial drop in poverty for the first half of the year. Uh, the full year data will come out in a, just a couple months, I think. I don't know the exact date. It's either November or December. Now, we can project based on past experience that it's likely that the new poverty rate uh, for the full year will be substantially below what we saw in, in 2015. Although that's a little bit complicated because we also know that 2018, in the second half of the year, there is fairly high inflation, and that high inflation might erode a bit of the progress on poverty. But nonetheless, I'm fairly confident in saying that we can expect that the full year poverty rate for 2018 will show continu a continued drop in poverty. <clears throat> so then, okay, what's the overall story? Well, we see that for quite a long period of time, the Philippines has had uh, relatively small changes, small declines in poverty, and then in recent years, uh, starting with the 2015 data and then the 2018 data, we see a more substantial drop. So that's basically good news. But over the longer trend, or over the longer time period, we see that generally overall improvements in welfare have been relatively slow in the Philippines compared to East Asia and the Pacific overall. So what this figure shows is the fraction of the population in all of East Asia and the Pacific in various income groups. Uh, and so there, we've labeled names to the income groups. These correspond to different cutoffs in terms of uh, income at a internationally comparable level. But you can see there's an extreme poverty group at the top, and then there's the global middle class group at, at the bottom, and several groups in between. So this is over the time period uh, 2002 up th through 2015. And you can see for the, the broader region over this period, we saw extreme poverty come close to being wiped out. I think it's coming down from roughly from close to 30% to uh, less than 5% for the region as a whole. And we saw a huge number of people enter the global middle class. So overall, large improvements uh, in the region as a whole. So this is the picture for the Philippines. So for most of this period, despite the fact that this was a period of fairly substantial economic growth through most of the, the period, we see relatively little uh, economic progress in terms of groups moving up. 
Now, this is just up through 2015, and you do see a little bit of upswing at the end. You can see the extreme poverty group shrinking uh, and the moderate poverty group shrinking uh, in, the, in the last few years. And if we could extend this out to 2018, we would see even more progress. Uh, but overall, the, the general story has been uh, relatively little progress in the Philippines compared to the rest of the region, and also considering the relatively high level of economic growth uh, for the period. So another way to kind of look at this whole story is to look at uh, various uh, annual growth rates over 2006 to 2015. <clears throat> so annual GDP per capita growth during that period was 3.6%, and that's a pretty respectable rate of economic growth. I'm not sure exactly how that ranks worldwide, but it must be in the, the higher ranks of growth rates uh, across the world. But if you look at the growth in average wages over that period, it was quite slow, just 0.4% per year. Now wages uh, are an imperfect measure because not everybody's working uh, in a wage job. Many people are non-wage jobs, so they're their incomes wouldn't be captured by this measure. Uh, and we also have the fact that some people during this period were moving out of non-wage jobs into wage jobs and, and seeing improvements in their income. And so that also wouldn't be captured in this measure. But nonetheless, it's, it's striking how little wage growth uh, was taking place. Uh, so another measure is average income. This is based on the household survey data, that which grew at 1.6%. And so 1.6% per year is enough to have some impact on people's welfare, but it's pretty slow, and, and slow relative to the growth in GDP per capita. We can also look at the median income growth, which is 2.2%, a little bit better, uh, still surprisingly low compared to overall uh, GDP per capita growth. And another measure that we like at the World Bank is the average income of the bottom 40%, the poorest 40% in the population. So that grew at a rate of 2.9%, actually faster than overall income as measured in the household survey. So this seems like a generally pretty positive story. Just looking at the survey data, you get a story of declining inequality. Uh, but of course, there's a quite substantial uh, caveat to this, which is that survey data is quite limited in terms of its ability to shine light on what's happening at, at the very top. And the, the first presentation gave, I think, a quite uh, eloquent explanation of, of why this is. Uh, to go a, a little bit into the details, so household surveys, you know, this is when survey enumerators from PSA show up at people's houses or apartments and say, okay, what's your job? How many people are in your household? What was your income in all these different categories? And then PSA takes all that information and crunches it and produces uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of data. So we know that uh, people, wealthier people, are first less likely to respond to these surveys. They can be less likely to be interviewed at all because they might live in a house or an apartment which an enumerator can't get to. Uh, they may ref be more likely to, ref to refuse to answer these surveys. And when they respond to these surveys, uh, it's likely that they will underreport their income, especially capital income, uh, which is, you know, they may be re reluctant for various reasons to report that income. So uh, that's all to say that we, we realize that what's going on at the very top is not well captured in our household surveys. And when we look at this sort of mismatch between what's going on with average income in the survey and GDP per capita, that raises the possibility that what's happening is that a disproportionate part of the gains from growth are going to those at the very top that's not, not captured in the household survey. Now the first uh, speaker, talked about this global project to try and understand all that better using tax data. We, know we, don't have, uh, we don't have that kind of data in the Philippines, or at least not access to that data to be able to do that kind of analysis for the Philippines. But we have sort of other circumstantial evidence that part of what's happening is this uh, large share of the gains going to, to those at the top. Uh, one piece of that is that if we look at the national accounts data, there's a measure of the share of income which goes to capital versus to, to labor, and the share going to capital has increased over time. Uh, the, the owners of capital typically are wealthier people, so this suggests that's part of what's happening. Now another very rough measure, uh, so we took 
the, the Forbes, the wealthiest 15 Filipinos in the Forbes, uh, richest Forbes list from 2006 to 2018 and looked at how their wealth had grown over that period. And there, we found that their real wealth had grown by an average rate of 9.1% uh, per year. So this, this is, of course, also, again, highly caveated. It's rough estimates uh, from Forbes. Uh, you know, it's just a, a very limited slice of, of the wealthiest. But this is also suggests that there may be some to this general story that uh, the gains have gone disproportionately to those at the top. Now, if you look at the household survey data, so you can produce an inequality measure based on the household survey data. Uh, so this, is, this shows the Gini based on household surveys for many countries around the world. Uh, the Philippines comes out at 40% or 0.4 in that measure, which is relatively high, but not at the extreme level. Again, with the caveat that we know we're not capturing the very top uh, uh, in this data for the Philippines or for uh, any other country. You know, another measure uh, looking at the cross-section is an estimate of the wealth share of the top percentile, so the, the share of wealth in the country owned by the top 1%. Uh, this is from a study by Credit Suisse, also imperfect, not, uh, not something to uh, bet your fortune on, uh, but uh, it shows the Philippines being one of the most unequal countries in the world by this measure, with more than half of the wealth of the country owned by the top 1%. Okay, so that's the review of the numbers. So then a question for us is going forward, what are some priorities, what are the key challenges to reduce poverty and boost shared prosperity to ensure that a greater share of the gains going forward uh, goes to those who are not at the very, very top? Or maybe, or maybe to say that not only those at the very top uh, benefit. So looking at the overall poverty situation for the country, one thing which is quite striking is the very high levels of poverty in areas which are affected by conflict, and also the very high levels of poverty in the areas most affected by uh, natural disasters. So it's principally parts of Mindanao for uh, conflict, especially the Barm region and areas around Barm, and then for uh, disasters, it's eastern Visayas, uh, where several areas are, you know, are hit. Uh, quite regularly by uh, by typhoons, so this is clearly uh, has, has a major impact on uh, poverty. Uh, the poor generally are vulnerable to both conflict and natural disasters. Now, looking forward, uh, there is reason to be even more concerned about the longer-term impact of climate uh, on on the poor and the overall economic distribution. So, the, this is some analysis I produced. This, is, this takes the same economic categories uh, we had in the earlier figure, so these five different economic groups from extreme poor down to the global middle class, and projects forward to up to the end of the century. So from now forward to the end of, of the century, what we, how we expect those groups to evolve. So this is a scenario projecting forward based on uh, economic growth in the absence of climate change. So in this scenario where climate change does not uh, affect us. In this scenario, you see that extreme poverty and then even moderate poverty is completely wiped out by roughly the middle of the century. And by the end of the century, during the second half of the century, most Filipinos join the global middle class. Uh, so in a scenario with climate change, you see uh, much worse potential results. Uh, so this is based on some analysis produced, uh, it's a long story, maybe I'll, I won't try to explain it, but projecting forward, the, the impacts of climate change could be quite extreme on economic growth and thus on, on poverty and the distribution for the Philippines. In this scenario, we could see uh, roughly by 2050 economic growth stalling almost completely and uh, the most Filipinos not entering the global middle class. Okay, so that gives us what I see as two key challenges to reducing poverty and boosting shared prosperity. First, strengthening peace building and particularly particular, particular, uh, supporting the work of BARM so that the, the BARM administration can be a success. And second, protecting the country from climate and disaster threats through both mitigation and adaptation efforts. So the, my the previous speaker already 
uh, uh, mention this point that on the, so on the human capital side, I'd point to two points. First, that one in three, three children under age five in the Philippines is stunted. This is, is a concern because stunting is a key marker for malnutrition, and we know from research both in the Philippines and around the world that children who are stunted are uh, likely to have limited cognitive development. Uh, to be more, they're more likely to drop out of school early, they're likely to struggle to learn in school, and they're less likely to get good jobs uh, as adults. So it's one in three overall, but actually half of children uh, in the poorest quintile who are stunted. Uh, so the second point under human capital I'd point to is that of the quality of schooling. Now the Philippines has done a tremendous job in getting more children into school. This is a measure of the average expected years of schooling for a child born today uh, in the Philippines and other countries in ASEAN. So after a whole series of efforts, the introduction of senior high school, universal kindergarten, uh, the impacts of the four Ps, and various other education efforts, now Filipino children are very likely to go to school and at least finish uh, junior high school and many now, now senior high. So in this average years of schooling measure, the Philippines is actually number two after Singapore in, in all of ASEAN. Uh, but of course, what's important with schooling, with school is not just how much time you spend in school, it's what you learn while you are there. So we've produced a learning adjusted uh, years of schooling measure. And without going into the fine details on that, I'll just show you that, so for the Philippines, the average years of learning adjusted school is 8.4. So by that measure, the Philippines is no longer number two in ASEAN, and this uh, shows that there's this learning gap, this gap between the learning adjusted number and the non-adjusted number, <clears throat> uh, and that indicates the importance of, of boosting uh, school quality. Uh, so that gives me two additional challenges, uh, reducing child malnutrition and closing the learning gap in basic education. So I only have two minutes left, so I'm going to skip quite quickly through uh, a couple of the other challenges, which are building quality infrastructure and opening the economy to competition. And so these we think more of as general issues for boosting economic growth, but there are certainly aspects uh, of these that could be focused principally on boosting those at the bottom. Uh, there is you know, infrastructure in, in, in rural areas, and there are aspects as well of opening the economy to competition that can be uh, carried out in a way which especially benefits those at the bottom. So then the final point is, I think in, in all of these areas, there are existing government policies and programs intended to address these challenges. So this points to what the, the principal challenge, what we call the overarching priority, is implementation on those policies and programs. And that points to the need to upgrade the public administration we like to say to, to be fit for purpose, which is a bit of World Bank or development speak, uh, but to say that the, the public administration now doesn't have what it needs to be fully successful in terms of implementation. Uh, and that comes, to, that comes with a variety of different uh, sort of sub-challenges. Uh, among those, we see the need to improve public procurement practices, uh, to improve the overall uh, capacity of, of the civil service, and to reduce uh, some of the overlapping responsibilities between uh, different agencies. So that's it, I will stop there. I think I've come in just under my, my two minutes and uh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you for that uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. And I, I guess this is also from uh, the country diagnostics done by the World Bank. And uh, these are preliminary, preliminary uh, results of that, uh, of that report. Okay, so as, uh, well, it's good news for the Philippines apparently because its poverty rate continues to drop. Uh, also, we have declining inequality, but I think very slow in terms of uh, progress. And uh, Dr. Lemon Bean also mentioned uh, the significant impact of climate change and also the peace, uh, peace and order situation in Mindanao that's affecting uh, uh, poverty in the Philippines. So probably we can further look into the, the issue uh, by, uh, from our next uh, presenter. 
uh, Dr. Um, Ruel Briones, who is actually the se a senior research fellow at the PIDS. He is also the lead author, actually, of this uh, annual public, in the conceptualization of this annual public uh, policy conference. So, Dr. Well is uh, our expert in, uh, in agriculture. Uh, he, has, he's, he, he was a former uh, board member of the, um, or president of the Philippine Economic Society, uh, board member. And so, uh, and the, uh, he he took he has his he took his uh, PhD studies from uh, the University of the Philippines in Niliman. So, without uh, further ado, uh, Dr. Bionis, please. Thank you, Dr. Balesteros. Uh, oops. All right. So you can see the title of this presentation. Oh, where is it? Yeah, it's phrased as a question because this presentation uh, is very much work in progress. Unlike the previous three speakers, I will not be here to answer questions. Uh, the nature of this report at this stage right now is mostly raising them. So Gabrielle was wondering what this talk would be about, not about inequality in this room, but looking at uh, Philippines inequality from the lens of structural change, meaning the composition of where the income is being generated across the basic sectors, mainly focusing actually on agriculture. So one reason, one motivation why uh, this study was made is because let me uh, support uh, the, uh, Gabrielle's endorsement of this report. And one of the key findings uh, it, here is that uh, from 2006 to 2015, they did a decomposition of the sources of poverty reduction. And if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> approximately a little less than two thirds of the reduction came from the movement of workers out of agriculture, which does two things. It causes, uh, it, it shifts uh, a worker to a higher uh, paying job, and it actually uh, indirectly raises wages among the remaining workers in agriculture. Uh, the second source, one half, is actually a transfer program of many sorts. Of, of course, the leading one is uh, uh, the four-piece program of government, but this also includes even private transfers from household to household or from, say, overseas uh, remittances. So how, how did that happen? Uh, Two-thirds plus one-half, that's more than... Yeah, it's because entrepreneurial incomes contributed a negative 15%. Uh, to, to uh, poverty. That means uh, had entrepreneurial incomes not fallen, just kept constant uh, in real terms, then poverty would have been 15% bigger. Uh, poverty reduction would have been 15% bigger than what was actually experienced in 2006. So that, that the first part, the, the reduction part, involves the movement out of agriculture. So we'll have some discussion of what... Uh, what that uh, agricultural employment entails in terms of some, not even stylized facts, some stereotypes about uh, agricultural employment. Have a look at some of the data on the Philippines based on official uh, information, which I will point out uh, has some gaps and therefore this motivates a more micro study of selected uh, villages, about 30 villages in selected provinces of the Philippines. And then, of course, ending, as I said, with some further questions. So here are some uh, notional idea about agricultural employment and therefore the role it plays in poverty reduction. The idea is if you're a wage worker in agriculture, you're mostly in agriculture. So that's one common impression. You may be doing a lot of agricultural activities, but on an intermittent basis. So you might be doing weeding someday, and another day land preparation, and so on and so forth. However, uh, your annual work cycle is punctuated by seasonal demand of whatever happens to be the main crop in your area. In the areas we went, it's Nueva Ecija, so Palay. So uh, the, the, the season there is land preparation, one uh, peak of the cycle. And then the second peak is harvest, then repeat for the second cropping. For uh, the other area, which is Negros Occidental, that's uh, uh, the single peak 
of uh, harvesting season, oh sorry, two peak also, land preparation and uh, harvest season of the sugarcane industry, which happens to be the main crop there. Uh, the tendency is uh, the, the lesser skilled, meaning lower educated uh, individuals are the ones who end up in agricultural work. And of course, wages here are low, hence the, the, the importance of the structural change, right? If you move the worker from agriculture to non-agriculture, on average, that will raise the wage and therefore cause poverty to go up, uh, yeah, income to go up, poverty to go down, especially if the person who left uh, the sector happened to be poor. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the age profile, it's younger people tend to be those who move out uh, of agriculture rather than the, leaving behind the older people. Uh, for farm operators, so that's the wage workers, uh, they may have probably higher, they're probably better off than the pure wage workers, the landless wage workers, precisely because of their additional income from access to land, whether they own the land or are uh, ten, uh, renting the land. But in the Philippines, or in many developing economies, there are still mostly smallholders. So it's still true that the earning equivalent, the daily earning equivalent of such workers who are farm operators is still lower. So it still pays to do the structural transformation of moving them uh, from agriculture towards, uh, uh, out to, uh, to another sector, uh, most, uh, which is on average a better paying sector. So let's see uh, what, what's, uh, what's um, oh, okay, so I think this summarizes uh, what I already mentioned, that when you have that shift, you expect a reduction of, of poverty with a movement of resources, mainly labor, from uh, agriculture to non-agriculture, actually preferably industry, which is actually happening in Philippines. In a while, I'll be talking about it. Uh, but the, also the bigger, the bigger catchment area is, of course, services, which is the biggest uh, employer in the Philippines today. So this supposedly reduces poverty, and if this causes wages in agriculture to also rise, we've been uh, hearing reports that, uh, oh, I can hardly find, you know, lots of farm operators are complaining. I can hardly find harvesters. I can fi hardly find uh, laborers to work in my farm anymore. Well, probably we can guess that that's tightening of the labor, local labor market, and that might lead to higher wages, even in real terms. And so that causes the convergence of uh, earnings in agriculture and non-agriculture and potentially reduce inequality. So let's see some of the actual facts and figures for Philippines. So if you see here this chart, uh, I'm using, this is somewhat a different version of uh, family income and expenditure survey data. This has been merged with the labor force survey data so that we could exploit the information, the, the uh, occupational information of the household head in the labor force survey with the income profile of the household in the uh, 2015 FIES. So we can see here, uh, still, uh, despite the, the merging, it's still fairly close to uh, official data. You have, um, if you look at the poverty uh, in the entire country, where is it? Population poverty, 23.3%. Okay, uh, according to that merged data set. Higher in urban than in rural areas. In fact, 79% uh, of the poor, uh, compare that to the actual figure of 21.6%, official estimate. Almost 80% of the poor are actually in rural areas, hence the characterization of poverty remaining mostly a rural and agricultural phenomenon. Why agricultural? Here we have agricultural workers based on occupation of the household head. And tagging that, 62.4% uh, of that group, uh, sorry, 62.4% of the poor worker belong to that group of agricultural workers. So one way of thinking about it is if you have an anti-poverty program, but you focus on sectors outside of agriculture, you're actually missing most of the poor, right? Because they're, all, they're mostly all bunched up there. In addition, uh, there's a high correlation with ha uh, visible underemployment. If you look at visible underemployment, the poverty rate of that group is 34%, and about 21% of the poor worker uh, is also visibly underemployed. Visible underemployment is the worker is employed, but uh, uh, they're working below 40 hours per week of uh, equivalent, and they express the desire to want uh, more hours of work. If it's simple underemployment, 
then they express, uh, simply express desire for more hours of work, although they may be actually working already at 40 hours per week. All right, so that's some of the figures there. Oops, okay, so my animation is, my, my mouth is running ahead of my animation, so. Uh, all right, here are some statistics about agricultural employment. The share has been dropping, we know that. That's typically, uh, that's Cosnet's famous observation. The one reliable, uh, stylized fact about uh, economic development, uh, proxied by per growth of per capita incomes, is the declining share of agriculture, both in uh, output and also even in employment. Although the employment drop usually lags the drop in uh, output, in share, in share of output. Notice, though, that since 2011, okay, just say actually it's uh, from 2011, but this uh, table comes from, starts from 2013. You can see not just a relative decline in number of workers in agriculture in terms of employment share, the absolute number of workers, according to PSA data based on the labor force survey, has been on the decline. So from 11.8 million down to 10.3 three or so million people over the period 2013 to 2017. This is unprecedented. There have been years where agricultural work has declined, but these are usually uh, brief episodes, like during a big El Nino uh, uh, episode. But this is a sustained decline in absolute numbers. And this has been accompanied by rising real wages using the 2012-based uh, CPI. So not only have nominal wages been increased, even if you account for inflation, uh, the, the real wages have, ri have been rising. And obviously with the declining share and the actual number of workers, even though uh, GDP growth of agriculture it's itself has been very tepid, you know, the, the least uh, gr uh, fastest growing sector in the Philippines compared to industry and services, the output per worker has been dramatically improving uh, in real terms. So just recall uh, that uh, indicator, 1.6 million, if you believe these figures, 1.6 net departure of uh, agricultural uh, workers out of agriculture uh, into uh, other occupations. Um, so I, uh, as, a, as an anecdote, uh, like to say that uh, we conducted a survey and we were looking for agrarian reform beneficiary organization members uh, at random, randomly selected, but then we were told that, sorry, they're only available after 5 o'clock because they're busy uh, doing a nearby Department of Public Works and Highways construction. And there's a very strict time in, time out there. <laughs> so you can't bother them. All right, so this is some very remote rural area randomly selected in our survey. So this, this is an example. They're moving to industry because in construction is part of industry. All right, so other facts from labor statistics, visible in under, underemployment in agriculture is about 20%. Uh, agriculture and industry employment dominated by male workers, although there's a nearly even split. I have tables and figures for this, but I chopped them off uh, for the interest of time. So just take it on faith uh, that there is that tabulation. Uh, and workers in agriculture tend to be older and shift to a higher age profile faster than other type of workers. Although uh, the statistics in 2015 indicate that, that only 18.6% of agricultural workers, both farmers and wage workers, are in the above 54 age uh, uh, bracket. So this is in a striking contrast with the usual narrative we see. In the newspapers, it's always reported that uh, uh, the average age of the Filipino farmer is 57 years old. I am unable to confirm uh, this statistic. Oh, okay, here is the breakdown by educational attainment. I won't spend so much time uh, discussing the precise figures, but in general, majority of workers in the Philippines have finished at least secondary school but the better educated ones tend to be working in industry and services and not in agriculture. All right, so there are some caveats uh, that we need from all of these official figures. If you look at the labor force survey, it's based on a one week reference period. So uh, if we analyze it, it's very difficult to see important patterns that I mentioned a while ago, like seasonality. Uh, because it doesn't have the full period spell of employment and underemployment that you can compare uh, across months of the year. So what we do is to address this need and various other uh, gaps in the official statistics, we conducted a household survey 
And we followed a panel of households for four quarters of a single year, last year, 2018. The reference period was one month. We attempted to make this out an entire three months, one quarter recall, but the recall was too difficult. The, the nature of the information we collected was uh, required too much recall. So we uh, restricted it to one month. And it, that will have implications. And we covered only households with, so we had a screening question, only households with agriculture as primary occupation of at least one member in the family, in the household, in the past month. So, uh, so we did this sampling. We selected uh, two provinces. The provinces, the biggest agricultural area provinces in the two regions that reported the highest number absolute terms of agricultural workers. That turns out to be Nueva Ecija and uh, Negros Occidental. We selected top three municipalities as stated there, and then uh, top seven barangays, and then 10 households by random sampling. We only collected the data from rural barangays based on the official statistics of the PSA of what is a rural barangay from the Philippine Standard Geographic Code. So here are some of the findings. So we targeted 400, and already in rural areas, you can see uh, some attrition over just one year. Uh, we finally lost like 12 households over the period. Uh, so we went down to 408, fully enumerated panel uh, by, by uh, the fourth quarter. So uh, approximately similar number of individuals, well, uh, uh, same number of uh, households by design in Nueva Ecija and uh, Negros, Occidental, except because of bigger household size in the former province, you have a bit num bigger number of uh, individuals. We enumerated in information for all of these uh, persons. All right, so I'm going to be flashing quite a few figures. This is going to be overwhelming, so I won't be dwelling so much time. You have the copy of the presentation, I believe. Uh, it can be downloaded somewhere uh, in PIDS website, and you can pour over the figures some more carefully, but let me just summarize uh, what's happening here. We're looking here at member, uh, uh, individuals uh, of a working age, and you could see that uh, they're the slight majority a slight minority of, are, of these individuals of working age, 15 and above, are female. The average schooling is about uh, high school education, uh, junior high, eight to seven to eight years. Now, among these working age, how many are employed? Uh, in the first quarter, 60.6%. That declined to about 50% by the fourth quarter. Uh, with uh, yeah, uh, So these are, remember, the same households, huh? but these are the trends we're seeing in the data. Uh, the share of females among the workers are quite low. It's uh, about a third of them. Among working age females, 15 above, how many are employed? About 40%. Whereas among working age men, males, 15 and above, about 78% uh, were employed, falling down to 62%. Now you might think, okay, they're getting more work. But remember, the cutoff is age 15. A lot of these people should actually uh, be, be, in, be in school, but you know, they're already, a lot of them are already working in, these, in this rural setting. So the, the, what are the employed doing? Uh, we divided, so employed here is based on, the classification here is based on what they uh, referred to as their primary occupation. So we classified them as either uh, agricultural occupation or they have a non-agricultural occupation or they have their own business operation which is also subdivided into agricultural business operation, meaning farmer mostly, or agri-related business, and uh, non-agricultural business occupation. This ex employment here excludes uh, individuals of working age, because, uh, below 15, because they're not supposed to be working per Philippine law, but in fact, in our sample, we found that, that there was a quite substantial number that were working, up to a third uh, by, by the fourth quarter. So, okay, there's a, among the agricultural workers, a lot of them are holding down a single job, but a fairly large number are holding down a second, second job or second business. Uh, those with multiple occupations, they're about a fourth, declining to 14% of the sample. Among business operators, the share of single business, so if you're, if you're in farming, say, you're mostly only farming and no other sideline business, although a, again, a fairly substantial number have other secondary employment. 
So those with the secondary business and no uh, um, uh, work, uh, sorry, wage employment, they're about 6%. But notice that the quarter by quarter figures vary wildly, and I have something to say about that. Average daily basic pay is uh, pretty low, averaging about 260 pesos. Uh, now, that rises a bit. So the ba da basic daily pay is based on the primary occupation, not necessarily agricultural. Um, it rises somewhat if you include daily pay, uh, because uh, we, we look at all the occupations together. So if we sum them up, then the daily pay equivalent goes up. And finally, if we incorporate the total compensation, including business, and we convert that to daily wage equivalent, uh, the average actually goes down because this something bad happened to entrepreneurial incomes or the way we measured entrepreneurial incomes uh, in this survey. So this is one of the interesting patterns. A lot of them are working more than the 40-hour standard. So the share of visible underemployment is very low. Uh, so you would never have guessed that the survey would show these figures if you just look at our uh, labor force statistics. Okay, well, that holds for both uh, wage workers and agricultural workers. Oh, it turns out that, yeah, a fairly substantive share are in agriculture, which what you expect, 60 or so percent. But uh, services is uh, a fairly substantial number as well, and then some industry, mostly in construction. Among the business operators, surprisingly, it's very low. So there are actually, in those rural villages we went to, relatively few farmers. And in fact, in the first quarter, none of them, amazing, none of them were, were farming. But some of them trickled in uh, over the course of the, uh, the, the quarters. All right, uh, of those employed in, so now we're focusing on those employed in agriculture. They're mostly in agriculture, okay? So their primary job is agriculture. But then again, a significant number, starting from 36% in quarter one, down to about a fifth in quarter four, have sideline or secondary employment, okay? Uh, and of course, if you total up all of their working hours among agricultural workers only, then they're also close to working full time with very low, about 3% average uh, visible underemployment rate. Their daily compensation is uh, lower than the average I showed you a while ago. Uh, but there's a large variation from quarter to quarter, and are st we're still trying to figure out what's behind this. Now, that's agricultural workers, this, just this one slide. <laughs> uh, this is cohort analysis. What we do is, we you fix the definition of, or you fix the identity of the workers, uh, say, on the first quarter. In this case, this is the first quarter, who are reporting as agricultural workers? In our sample, that's uh, 477 uh, individuals. Uh, of course, by definition, by selection of that group, 100% of them, their primary job is agriculture in the first quarter. Notice what happens. By quarter four, less than half of them, 47% of them, have already shifted out of agriculture. Quite a large number actually say that they stop working altogether. But a lot have shifted to non-agricultural work uh, or have g gone back to farming because uh, they went to agricultural business. All right. So uh, we have a lot of patterns, but I think I'll skip to the end because I summarized all of these. Right, majority work, not in agriculture, but not as farmers. Many have secondary employment. Most work full-time. Involuntary unemployment is low. There is low pay from agricultural work for agricultural workers, but there are large quarter-to-quarter -quarter, uh, variations. If you do a cohort analysis, we realize that agricultural workers switch occupations frequently on a three-month basis, okay? Uh, and some of them actually stop working entirely for the quarter. They switch when agricultural work is scarce or daily pay in agriculture is low. In doing so, they maintain similar level of working hours and basic daily pay. Okay. Agricultural workers are mostly male. Female agricultural workers also have shorter working hours. Daily pay in agricultural work is slightly lower for females, but daily compensation for all work done is higher than for males. Interesting. Two-thirds of agricultural workers in prime work, uh, are in prime working age. The older workers do not mean that they're better paid. Four-fifths of agricultural workers, a huge number, did not finish high school. I don't know if that's a surprise. Maybe it's what's surprising is such a large number. 
Uh, among agricultural workers, better educated does not necessarily mean better paid. That's, I think, important. Agricultural workers are found in both rural and peri-urban zone. The closer to the urban center, this is an interesting pattern, the higher the average daily basic pay in agriculture. Okay, And when you think about it, yeah, that makes sense, right? Because there's bigger competition now. Uh, to, to keep people in agricultural work, you have to pay higher wages because there are more higher paying alternatives. So some, some of the stylized facts hold up. There's more agricultural employment for men. There's low daily pay, slightly higher for men in agriculture, of average low educational attainment. But agricultural workers tend to be of prime working age, not much older. Uh, involuntary underemployment is low, contrary to uh, national statistics. Variation, there's a huge variation in daily pay in agriculture. Uh, oh, sorry, not a huge, some variation over space. So what does this mean? I, it suggests that we need a more nuanced understanding of agricultural employment. And since we have that nuance, more nuanced understanding, then we should have a more nuanced understanding of structural change. If a worker is, by statistics, said to be leaving agriculture, they may come back to agriculture. It just so happened that your reference period was too short to catch it, right? Uh, they may not necessarily leave the area, the, the village. They might actually stay in the same village, but do a non-agricultural job in the same village. Maybe instead of saying move out of agriculture, we should have a better understanding of how, how long or short is the spell of agricultural employment of the workers, especially in rural areas. So what does this demand? We need to look at a national... We, this... this, uh, this um, Survey is admittedly not nationally representative, but I think if we could do some study like this, ahem, we'll need a lot of resources. Nationally representative, time series, panel data of agricultural workers, uh, track them over an entire calendar year, that, which was done in this survey, and then also link that to a study on the importance of rural urban migration. I understand that NEDA uh, already conducted a rural migration study. I think I see mercy here, uh, but unfortunately, I was a sneak peek, unlike what Gabriel did for the World Bank study. But uh, maybe, uh, I think in a while that, that uh, study will come out. It will be interesting to compare that study with some of the findings here. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Roel. Um, time check, it's, it's uh, 3.35, so in the interest of time, uh, I would like to open the floor for uh, questions. We have mics on the floor. And please, uh, you can direct your questions to any one of our speakers. So please state your name and your institution. OK, yes, please. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Rod Silicius. I head a research firm, and we are conducting also similar studies. My first question is on Dong Yun Park. Uh, is it uh, safe to say that when there is an increase in GDP, the poverty is also reduced automatically? Uh, quite clearly, that, that, that's not the case. There are many cases where there's been a lot of economic growth in terms of the size of the pie being increased quite quickly, but because of inequality of opportunity and the uh, fruits of growth accruing to just a tiny pop politically and otherwise well-connected elite, uh, it's not widely shared. So that's a very negative kind of economic growth. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. For that. Thank you. It confirms our doubts that you cannot really equate GDP to reduced uh, poverty. And as a matter of fact, uh, Gabriel here uh, has also demonstrated that we have a similar conclusion about the reasons for poverty and the uh, intervention that should be done. Number one, your climate change, conflict, etc. Because we had done our research in Mindanao, no? So, also with uh, Dr. Briones, that um, 
poverty will always be there if the agricultural workers cannot migrate to industrial services or other uh, industries. Uh, we have the same conclusion, like health is a factor. Education is also a factor. And uh, education because while there is an intervention in education, the fact is the manner that the education or instruction is made is very uh, problematic. Uh, how you instruct the students is uh, more important than the curriculum. But right now, we are not concerned about, we just deliver the modules curriculum, but we don't have a measurement of whether uh, there is some kind of understanding. Because this is what is happening to us. When we are professionals, we know a lot about things that we know, but we do not know how to translate it to the label of the farmers. Yeah, yeah, there's a book about curse of knowledge, which says, uh, when you're already stuck to that knowledge, you can no longer change your mindset. So it, it's, not, it's not supposed to be you who should translate it because you are stuck to it. But anyway, uh, my assessment is we have the same conclusion in our studies, that unless we uh, migrate the agricultural workers to other industries, then they will remain as the uh, underprivileged. And last one, your, your uh, conclusion that there is only 9% holding the income or the, the wealth of the Philippines, that is already 20 years the same as in 20 years ago. In fact, it was the late uh, Senator Solnago said that the economy of the Philippines is being held by at least 10% of the rich families. Thank you very much. Okay, um, can we keep our questions uh, short and concise and probably if we want further discussions with the, with the speakers, uh, we can do that after the, the session. So uh, what I'll do in order to give us opportunity for others, can we have two questions at a time and then we can ask the speakers to respond. So any other questions? Yes, please. The Of this. Thank you. My name is Rick Tokero from the Office of the Chief Economist Department of Finance. Uh, it's good to note that based on data, real income of uh, agricultural farmers are rising in the Philippines. Uh, but uh, I'm also curious about those who may not be captured but by the data. I mean, those who haven't been mainstreamed those who belong to the informal sector has to, until today. Thank you. I uh, would like to, uh, one more question, please. Yes, uh, Dr. Balisakan. <laughs> oh, okay. Good afternoon. My name is Engineer Talion from the Filipino Inventors uh, in Innovator Society. I am also mechanical. Uh, on the equality, working equality, and uh, we'd like to point out for the last speaker that uh, <clears throat> the in the agricultural sector there is a there is a two two twi uh, twice harvest, but it's good now that the president had uh, appointed uh, William Dar, who is now an AIM, uh, AIT uh, expert from other countries, of course, here in the Philippines, uh, in the agricultural sector. Now, uh, the only question here is that uh, there is really going down of the worsening uh, equality here. Because, uh, you know, in the Philippines, you see, very simple that the rise here is a goes from 45 to 52, in, uh, or 37 to 42. In other countries, it is only around 15, 15 pesos to 20, 15, 17 pesos. Now, the take a look on, uh, in which we'd like to point out to the PIDS that uh, we could uh, hope to supply for the so-called chains, good chains that on the agricultural sector, 
we could uh, we could uh, have a so called five to seven, six times harvest per year I mean to say we have a rice that uh, is around 65 days compared to around uh, 90 days on its production and also of course the utilization of portable fertilizers or the so called fertilizers coming from the seaweeds and plus the so called uh, uh, company which need this one to be studied more by the by your sector, sir. And we'd like to point that this thoroughly be implemented maybe on the next year uh, so that this, uh, this uh, forum would go that there is the worsening studies should only, if we could exercise the so-called innovative, uh, innovative research from, from us, uh, from the inventors group, from the researcher group in the Philippines. This is addressed to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Briones. Question of Dr. Balisakan before I turn it over to the speakers. Uh, this notion that <clears throat> that uh, agriculture is no longer um, poverty reduction depends so much on the current. Uh, characteristics or states of of, uh, of uh, agriculture. For example, in areas where uh, uh, where agriculture is quite close to uh, uh, to urban areas, uh, where there are opportunities for for uh, uh, services or manufacturing employment, the uh, power of agriculture to deliver power reductions perhaps weaker than than that in other areas. But in cases where uh, 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 that closeness or proximity to urbanization is not dead, uh, uh, among other things, including uh, uh, the quality of human capital and, and, <clears throat> and infrastructure, you find that, uh, uh, that agricultural development is still key to poverty reduction in, in those areas. So, uh, and given that the Philippines is so heterogeneous, you know, it's so uh, different across uh, from Lo from Batanes to the, to the south. The, the quality of agriculture, uh, of uh, urbanization, and and uh, and rural development is is so uh, 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 heterogeneous. So it's it's not uh, correct to say that or argue that in all those cases, uh, agriculture uh, is inferior as a source of. Uh, of fiber reduction, reduction. I just want to, to make that clear. Can we ask uh, the speakers to? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the, the questions were mostly directed uh, about the agriculture study. Um, sorry, the the first one. Sorry, I, I for, forgot. Uh, oh, the, looking at the, uh, the the nature of the sampling really sought out. Uh, we, in fact. Uh, uh, one of the criteria for selecting uh, some of the rural barangays in a subsequent stage of the survey was to have an exclusion region 10 kilometers around the nearest urban center so that we could be sure that we're capturing uh, the, most, the more remote uh, rural areas uh, in our survey. And we do a random sampling based on barangay master list. So regardless of where you are, you're in the mountain, uh, we will look for you and interview you. Of course, we told our enumerators not to endanger their lives. But barring that, so we did. So it was truly a, a representative sample, at least for the areas that were selected. So I, I think if, if, the, if the official statistics is based on that kind of uh, sampling methodology, we're fairly certain or confident that it does capture even the more marginalized sectors. In fact, that's precisely why they were designed, no? to, to get figures, accurate figures on, say, poverty uh, and extreme poverty and so on. Uh, the second question, I believe, was about uh, uh, technological, uh, the need for innovation. Yes, indeed, uh, we're pointing out that uh, uh, we, we, we do need, we, we, can't, we can't say, even though we say that moving workers out of agriculture is one way, and I think it's also related to Dr. Belisakan's question, uh, a comment also. Uh, the remaining workers, they will keep on hosting the poverty unless something is also done for them, right? And one of the delivery mechanisms for boosting their incomes 
is uh, uh, technological change or rising agricultural productivity. The other, of course, is the natural supply and demand movement. If there are workers moving out of agriculture, uh, the remaining uh, the, the, and the constant labor demand, then that would bid up the wages. And I think that that's still a testament uh, to the continuing power of agriculture that even though you left it, the remaining workers still get a, 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 poverty, a, a poverty reduction boost from the simple fact of uh, rising uh, real wages uh, in that sector. Interestingly, one pattern is, as an area urbanizes, indeed the income opportunities from other, say, services and industry goes up, but turns out that even agricultural workers get compensated more uh, in the peri-urban fringe. So in fact, the expansion of urban centers as more and more barangays turn urban in more and more of our townships, then that is also a boost not just to structural change, but also incomes of people remaining in agriculture. Okay. Um, can we have the next set of questions, please? Yes, the lady. In Hello. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer from uh, Ebon Foundation. I would just like to suggest that we also look at how uh, we measure poverty um, in uh, really coming up with a realistic uh, poverty situation in our country because as we have all, always been stating, um, the poverty, uh, the methodology by which we measure poverty has been changed for three times, um, <clears throat> and each time that we change the methodology, some five million uh, households are dropped uh, or are elevated, move out of poverty. So in the last uh, change that we made, uh, there's this preferential diet that we call, which to our analysis, it's more of a forced diet rather than a preferential diet because, um, as we all know, um, uh, Filipino workers are paid uh, very low. And um, as what has been shown earlier, um, there's just that 4% uh, or uh, growth in um, wage wages. So if we could move or increase the wages of our workers, and then, of course, change the way we measure poverty into a more realistic measurement, then maybe we can have a more realistic uh, a view or how many Filipinos are really poor. And then maybe we can really have this uh, effective uh, policy reform to really um, move uh, more Filipinos out of poverty. And, of course, I support what uh, Mr. Badisakan had said earlier. Um, <clears throat> it's not that simplistic that if we move people out of agriculture, then we will have uh, uh, more Filipinos with better paying jobs because we uh, assert that we have to develop our agriculture to really uh, support industry. That's all. Okay, thank you. For another question, please. Yeah. Uh, let's give ch another chance uh, later. Uh, you, the girl in, uh, the lady in uh, at the back, please. Yes, um, maupaying uh, kulop. Um, good afternoon. I'm Leah from Oxfam in the Philippines, but we are Oxfam Great Britain. Um, I'm interested in the the study of the agriculture um, because um, I have two very specific questions. But um, please allow me, Mr. Um, speaker. Uh, the first question is that what is the coverage of our agricultural, when we say agricultural labor, so what does um, it include? For, is, does it include um, um, like planting, harvesting, and also marketing? Because I'm, uh, we're, we have a current, we have current um, intervention around unpaid care work, and we are very much interested in relation to the other findings, which is it says that women 
female um, agricultural workers have shorter working hours. So does your research cover the reason why? Um, why female or women have shorter engagement in ag agricultural force? Um, and um, because we're, we're thinking of its relationship to unpaid care, unpaid care work, women has to go back to their homes, do the unpaid care, and we all know that um, Philippine Statistical Authority don't have, um, as they have shared to us, they have limited information about unpaid care work data, and it is under SDG number um, 5, um, 4.1. Yeah, so I think that's two. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um the first, on the, the methodology, probably we can get some in comments from uh, either ADB and World Bank, and the second, I think, specifically was directed to Dr. Bionis. Yeah, well, just on the poverty methodology, I mean, that's a whole big topic in itself, which I, I didn't go into in, in, in my talk. I mean, generally, we think PSA does a pretty good job in their poverty uh, methodology. They use a similar approach that's to what's used all around the world, uh, which in, involves pricing a, a basic basket of goods and then seeing what fraction of households uh, uh, have uh, a level of consumption uh, uh, acceptable to reach to acquire the entire basket of goods. Now, I think uh, there's always things that could be changed and, and updated and improved, and we certainly see those, those possibilities. And there's also alternative poverty measurement approaches uh, very popular now is using a multidimensional poverty index, and, and PSA has recently introduced uh, an index uh, like that. I mean, generally, all of those different approaches so, show fairly simple, uh, similar results. Uh, and I think the general story that we see the, of overall disappointingly slow poverty reduction in the Philippines for a long period of time, and then in the last five, six years, a, a, a new, uh, more substantial drop. I think you would see that sort of regardless of methodological approach. But I, I, agree, I agree generally that uh, expanding our, the set of ways that we measure poverty is a, a good thing to do. Yeah, uh, I think the, the second question asked about the nature of the survey, and it also partly reflects back to what, uh, I forgot to address another point of Dr. Balisakan. There's so many agricultural activities and so many ways of paying uh, agriculture. We covered that all in our survey. We only excluded very tiny plots like backyard uh, gardening in our uh, enumeration of agricultural work. But something to do with crops, something to do with fishing, uh, but not trading, except for the uh, business side. If you're operating an agricultural trading, you're also classified as an agricultural business. However, it turns out in our sample, this is very small, uh, just less than 1% of agricultural business operators. So the bulk of them are actually operating farms. Now, uh, but if there's a breakdown of the various activities, the weeding, the planting, the different wages, there's a Pacquiao system <laughs> where you're paid by hectare, there's a daily pay, there's a payment in kind, there's a payment in cash. Uh, so it's... It's, uh, I, I, think, I honestly think I'll be spending a few years analyzing <laughs> this data set. And it's driving me nuts, or actually I'm driving my analyst nuts over there, uh, Isai, <laughs> operating. She's the one that doing the, uh, the, some of the analysis. So yeah, we covered that. One of the, um, thanks to a prompting, is Connie here? Thanks to prompting from uh, one of our fellows, we put in household work hours with some basic disaggregation there. We haven't done the analysis relating the shorter working hours of, work, of working women with uh, working hours of women in the home, but we hope to do that eventually in one of the subsequent uh, studies. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have another session at 4 o'clock, so I think we have to end uh, this session. Uh, we, let's thank our speakers, and uh, thank you all for your active participation. Coffee is served if you still have time. I think you still have uh, five minutes before the next uh, session. Thank you.